We're heading into what could be a very close election. Early voting has already started in some states, but millions of Americans don't trust the process. Many don't believe the system is fair or that the votes will be accurately counted. What should be done to improve our elections? We discuss reforms that both Reds and Blues could endorse. I'm Richard. You're about to hear from Larry and Walt of the Braver Angels Trustworthy Election Initiative. I would say that gerrymandering, redistricting, was the deepest point of agreement uh, from top to bottom of it being a problem that uh, deserves not just solution, but justice. Producing some sort of ID, agreed upon ID, it, you know, you need a driver's license, you need all kinds of things to, to enjoy certain benefits. Why would that not translate to, to voting? So uh, I was surprised by my own presuppositions that, that were wrong. Our show is about fixes. Yeah, how to make the world a better place. How How do do we we fix fix it? it? How do we fix it? How on earth do we restore confidence and trust in America's electoral system? The solutions have to involve both Democrats and Republicans, right? Trust in how we conduct elections has been declining for years. According to a national survey, nearly four out of five Republicans do not have high confidence that votes will be counted accurately in the forthcoming election. About a quarter of all Democrats feel the same way. So we have to do something. Fortunately, Braver Angels has made a beginning, a start. Its trustworthy elections report has reached unanimous agreement among liberals and conservatives who are members on a range of proposals. Some of the findings may really surprise you, including the recommendation about requiring ID to vote. The report was long in the making. It's based on more than two dozen workshops with nearly 200 participants. The initiative began nearly four years ago. Let's hear from Larry Mays, who leans blue, and Walt McKee, who leans red. Both are members of the Braver Angels Trustworthy Election Initiative. Larry Mays and Walt McKee, welcome to How Do We Fix It? Thanks for having us. Great to be here. Thank you. Millions of Americans have very little trust in how this country conducts its elections. Why was it important for you to put together a report to include suggestions from from both sides, from both reds and blues? Well, I would say personally, because I love America and I love my fellow Americans, there's enough people out there in the world, forces that want to harm us. If we're not all in it together, we may lose. Yeah, I would say, you know, the the subtitle of, of the report says we trust us and we are Americans, regardless of what one's political leanings are. We have great interest to be citizens and to continue to live in America where you can have differing opinions, but yet not demonize, I would say, the other, right? And so, you know, through these uh, 27 different workshops and more, it became very clear early on, we had something very important here that we should share with the rest of the country. How many folks got together, I mean, to do this? In our Braver Angels tradition, we always have a 50-50 split between red and blue. So we had a leadership committee of 12. Then we had, was it uh, 27 workshops across the country? Over 200 people participated in those, all red, blue, 50-50. In the tradition of uh, Braver Angels, any suggestions for us to consider about how to make elections more trustworthy, had to be unanimous. When Walt mentions the word unanimous, it means unanimous on both sides. The, it had to be a unanimous agreement among the, the Reds, as well as unanimous agreement among the Blues, before there, there was even a unanimous 
<laughs> understanding of the rest of it. So it was pretty intense. Going into this, what was the goal of the elections initiative? As, as we all know, the country is very polarized. The purpose of this was election by election, 2016 and 20, but yes, beforehand too, some people felt that there was an untrustworthy element of the elections, but that there was, you know, forces at work purposely and successfully undermining the election process. We wanted to uh, reverse that and, uh, and give the elections process transparency and credibility so that the fruits of that process, uh, the American leadership uh, would be empowered by this consensus that yes, this was a, uh, a reasonable and credible process that we went through. This might sound a little facetious, but but it's not. <laughs> Bear with me here. You you had hundreds of in-person hours of discussion, debate, personal connection. What were you doing during all that time? I, I'm going to say up front that it uh, Walt and I were uh, leaning on each other uh, constantly because and, and through it all, and we became very close. Like. Uh, man, this is madness. We got our own lives. <laughs> and uh, our wives and our family, we're not going to survive this. And, um, you know, we really kept uh, pushing each other on because we really felt that what we were doing was very important and powerful. We were not a think tank, right? We were citizens who come together dealing with a serious problem uh, for our country. While we did put in a lot of time and griped about that, no question, I also was grateful for the opportunity to be immersed in a tough subject with these folks. Do you ask, what did we do during all that time? A lot of what we did was listen. You know, that's a tenet of Braver Angels. You, you sit there and you listen uh, and you don't make faces and you, you know, seriously, intellectually open yourself. I would say that the moment that Larry and I became a team, as far as uh, be, uh, co-chair leadership, we were both at our real jobs. And uh, I kind of swiveled around in the chair and I said, dude, my wife asked me, who are these people <laughs> that you're spending all these times, all these hours with? And he's, he snorts and laughs and says, oh my God, I just got the same question. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a great bonding yeah. moment. Uh, and and Larry and I were probably fast friends at this point. Okay, so Larry and Walt, um, our listeners may be getting a little frustrated, thinking to themselves, okay, what did they actually recommend? What was the most surprising recommendation first? Uh, Larry? Oh, for me, it was definitely the agreement around voter ID as a as a person who leans blue. And and I was surprised as we were grappling with this voter ID issue. And I started to dig into it a little bit that, frankly, most of the country didn't think that voter ID was a bad thing. To be clear, um, your report says voters should be required to identify themselves and prove their eligibility before casting a ballot. That's right. Absolutely. And, you know, frankly, I was surprised even with myself producing some sort of ID, agreed upon ID. It, you know, you need a driver's license. You need all kinds of things to, to enjoy certain benefits. Why would that not translate to, to voting? So, uh, I was surprised by my own presuppositions that, that were wrong. Larry leans blue, is kind of liberal. Walt, you lean red. Uh, what was the most surprising recommendation to you? Was it was it this same thing, voter ID? I have to tell you that it was the same thing. You know, for decades, you know, I've I've got close friends uh, who lean blue. Over the decades, you know, we've. Uh, recreationally had political discussions. I, you know, was so hammered on this uh, voter ID thing. 
it wasn't even on my list. I would never even thought twice or even once about voter ID because I knew it was just an absolute bedrock, no-go zone. Uh, so there's going to be no consensus on that. So no one was more surprised than I was, you know, that it came up through the process because that means that all the blues, all the blues in those workshops uh, said, yes, some version of this is reasonable and we should do it. We've dealt with one recommendation, which which probably wasn't easy to get to, uh, which is voter ID. Uh, let's go to a second one, which is fair and equal access to voting. Uh, your report says that our election process should strive to remove barriers so that every citizen or each citizen has an equal and reasonable opportunity to cast a vote. Uh, talk about that. Democracy is based on voting and and I would say free elections, and we don't do it by gunpoint, right, or by the swords. Okay, and so, so you want to make voting as easy as possible, but fair, right? And and this is a word that I think is also very important, in that you do all that you can to an, annihilate any sort of shenanigans or cheating at all. We want uh, people to be able to vote, and we want them to be able to do it fairly. Uh, without encroachment, but to do it right. Did um, Walt, did Reds and Blues both recognize that some people do face barriers when it comes to to uh, being able to cast a vote? Yes. Barriers like, uh, you know, the arguments concerning voter ID, for instance. And we recognize that uh, we weren't suggesting that every state must implement a driver's license looking photo ID we said that each state should come up with a process that suits that state. We also looked at the integrity of the vote and uh, wanted the, uh, the ballots that are cast to be handled like police evidence with chain of custody and with a nod to the way uh, policing is going. Transparency is the currency, right? That was key. And the other thing is, you know, we one of the recommendations in terms of, you know, trying to make it fair is that um, we call for a federal election day, a national holiday uh, in order to vote. Right. And also, uh, which we were trying to address this issue of very long lines. Right. For people to vote. That could be an impediment uh, to voting. And so, you know, federal holiday, you know, making more polling places available. You know, you need to make it easy for everyone, regardless of where they live uh, in the country. We also emphasize if parties, uh, organizations want to put in poll watchers, uh, that uh, training for those poll watchers shall be provided. But at the same time, uh, we need the volunteers and the temporary workers who step up every couple of years to uh, operate the polling stations. And so when it came to threats against those people or actual assaults of any kind, we called for increased penalties against that uh, to not only give those people uh, more protection, but also to give those potential workers a uh, heart that, look, you are valued. Please continue doing the invaluable service that you do to our community by stepping up. That, that goes to the transparency and accountability recommendation that every citizen should be able to understand uh, the election process. Let's go to confidence in vote counting, because that's also related to this, that every legal vote should be counted as accurately as possible. How do we get agreement on that? <laughs> well, I won't take it. <laughs> You're so gracious. Um, we don't have like a national government for national elections. We have a federal government and individual states really operate these elections. There's different things are possible in different areas. Uh, different parts of the country have different traditions. And when I say traditions, I do not mean to give a wink and a nod in any way to some uh, good old boy situation 
or anything. Yeah, and and, and Walt also um, alluded, it mentioned earlier that the issues around you know the machines have to be tested beforehand, but also when we want a paper record of that vote. Larry Mays, who's kind of liberal, Walt McKee, who's conservative, both are members of the Braver Angels Trustworthy Elections Initiative. More of our conversation coming up. But first, word of what Braver Angels is doing for Election Day. And something nobody else has tried before. Braver Angels is going to send red and blue voters together to polling places across the country to show Americans, no matter who they're voting for, that we can and must get along. It's pretty easy to take part. Grab a friend from across the political aisle or a relative you always fight with at Thanksgiving and head down the street to the polls so that we can share this message of hope. You don't have a pair already? Or you want to meet somebody new? Braver Angels will work on finding you a match. Just sign up at braverangels.org slash election day. Now back to our interview, and we'll talk next about gerrymandering. This involves electoral maps that are usually drawn by politicians from one party or the other to favor them over the people they're supposed to represent. Larry says both Democrats and Republicans do it. Gerrymandering is when something is done that is unfair to the voter, when legislators cut up a district that benefits them or their party. Uh, and let's be clear, because most times we're thinking about, we hear about uh, gerrymandering, at least depending upon what uh, one's steady diet of media is, it appears that it happens predominantly from the, uh, from the right, from the reds. And that's not true, right? Gerrymandering happens on both sides, be it red or blue. I would say that gerrymandering, redistricting, was the deepest point of agreement uh, from top to bottom of it being a problem that uh, deserves not just solution, but justice. I myself live in Maryland in uh, crystal blue Montgomery County, just outside Washington, D.C., and it consistently elected a liberal Republican named Connie Morella. After she retired, I guess the determination was never again. (laughs) And so I now live in a district that is part of my county, goes out to Frederick County in Western Maryland, snakes on up to Baltimore County and Baltimore City. You know, once upon a time, Baltimore City was the most populous uh, and politically powerful place in Maryland. But over the the generations, uh, they lost population. And so the districts in Baltimore that had that power and wanted to keep that power started scooping in uh, suburban population. Never enough to give those suburbanites effective influence, but just enough to keep that that district in, in existence. Whether it's a church, a school, a government institution, or whatever, If it's populated by human beings, it's going to be susceptible, uh, red or blue, to corruption. You know, corruption will follow the path of least resistance. If there's a nook or a cranny, it'll flow in there. One of the solutions that we recommended was to take the elected officials out of the equation. To have independent citizen-led commissions that are are bipartisan or or nonpartisan? Yeah, well, you can't be truly nonpartisan. You know, a lot of school boards say they're nonpartisan with it. <laughs> you know, I think that with things like that, we ought to be frank about it and not kid ourselves. And yes, have multipartisan uh, represent- representation on redistricting committees. The Trustworthy Elections Report is a document that I think runs at least 30 pages and has a bunch of different recommendations that we don't have time to get into now. There will be a link to this report on our show page at howdowefixit.me. I did want to ask you about something that I guess 
underlines the importance of what you're doing, which is the need for a peaceful transition of power, that violence must never be used to decide an election in the United States. We had very contentious elections, potentially national elections. Um, you know, January 6th was, was, in, was in particular a real, a real stain on our country. But, you know, even before that January 6th went down, the conditions of that, the, the vitriol, the, the language in, of, of violence that we use against each other, the absolute absence in my mind of civility, where the uh, person who was uh, of a different party was other. This language has no space. We should give no quarter to it. It should have no space at all in our country. And we wanted to uh, not see that happen in any form again. You mentioned that you all became kind of close, spent many hours with each other. Uh, Was this trustworthy elections initiative fun for you or somewhat grueling? Yes. One more, let me jump in, Walt. I'll be like, just a quick, just a quick 10 seconds. First, I want to say, I want to thank my buddy, Walt. We, last year, the two of us went to a Braver Angels convention and Walt uh, was prepared, uh, you know, with he, he and I to sit down at midnight in a lawn uh, with lawn chairs, uh, smoking cigars. I have never smoked a cigar in my entire life. I don't smoke at all, but I did so with that with Walt because I just had such respect and love for him and we had a blast. It was the best cigar. It was my first cigar and I was just honored to be able to salute it and do it with Walt. It was a way to toast the moment. And by the way, it was midnight because it's like that's by by the time we got there and got set up it was a, it was late at night. I also wanted to just say something else, you know, quick about that I think extends from beginning to end on trustworthy elections and peaceful transfer of power. I learned in my religious education coming up that uh, relationships are based on trust, and that trust comes from mutually positive shared experiences repeatedly, and. In, this, in the case of this report preparation, that's, that's what we had. We, we practiced Braver Angel's uh, principles of listening and sharing and respect. And uh, week after week, month after month, these mutually positive shared experiences compounded on each other to the point where we had a great trusting relationship between us two and the committee. And that's the type of thing that elections have to be. That's Braver Angel's aim at the core of it, uh, to foment that type of civility from the ground up. Sadly, we're not seeing that relationship, that leadership from the top down. So we need to foment it amongst the people. Amen. So I'll ask this again, Larry, this whole process of putting together the trustworthy elections report, fun and grueling? It was both. Or both. <laughs> it was absolutely both. It was, it was fun, and, but also very grueling. And, you know, um, when Walt talks about the, the building of trust over the time, it was essential because uh, when we got to the end, you know, like, okay, we're, we are about to go to print. And we're going to go through everything one more time. It was it was a very emotional uh, time for us, where you had people that you you've come to, I would say, love and respect, who um, who were wavering on let's say a point or two, right? Um, and we're like, no, this is the con- this is the consensus that we agreed on, and we had gone over it over and over again. And it was what was powerful is when. Everyone said um, in that committee, you know what, uh, this works, you know, this, this works for me. So that was great, but tough. Thank you very much for joining us on How Do We Fix It? Thank you. 
Thanks for having me. Larry Mays and Walt McKee, you can find their report about trustworthy elections at braverangels.org slash trustworthy dash elections. You can also get a link to the report at our podcast website, which is howdowefixit.me. I'm Richard Davies. Our sound designer and producer is Miranda Schaefer. We're also grateful for all the help and ideas that we're getting for these shows from David Blankenhorn, Gabby Timmis, Monty Guzman, and others at Braver Angels. Thanks for listening. More timely episodes on How Do We Fix It coming up in the weeks and months ahead. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.